Hello everyone, I'm Professor Tim Spector, the lead scientist at the ZOE COVID study and Professor of Epidemiology at King's College in London. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Claire Steves, who's also on the ZOE COVID study and a reader at King's College London. Uh, Claire, just hi. To hi there. And Brendan Street, who's the professional head of emotional well-being at Nuffield Health, the UK's largest healthcare charity. And just say hi, Brendan. Hi, everybody. Good to meet you. And we're here this afternoon really to take a look at mental health and the pandemic, and really in, in three sections. So the first is looking at the effect of lockdown on our mental health. Second is looking at the effect of the actual virus on it. And the third is what we can all do about it uh, and looking at ways to cope and, and moving forward. Um, just before we start and dive in, um, I just want to um, ask each each of the, the my guests. So, ask Claire uh, just to say a few words about herself and, and some of the things you've struggled with during the pandemic. Claire. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Yes, well, it's it's great to be on here and and with you, sort of talking about our studies with. Um, our participants. We, we've been working on the study together since it began and um, I, I, I'm a geriatrician and so clinical um, person. I, I was behind sort of putting together the original design of the app questions and we've been working with the scientific team together on, on it to try to answer questions as quickly as we can get the message back to um, everybody that's been using it. Um, and um, uh, in terms of mental health for me, I guess as a mother of three kids, um, you know, the whole whole homeschooling thing put a lot of pressure on us. Um, in a way, though, I was protected, Tim, by working with you on this project. Um, and it, it did give us a really big mission. And I think that sort of sense of purpose really helped to carry me through the pandemic. But I know that that's not been the same for everybody. And many people have been affected very differently. And I think that's something that might come out in our discussions today. Yeah, and I think we're very grateful you, you made it today because I think you and your family uh, are struggling with a, a mild case of COVID. And I think um, I know you, you've got mild post-vaccination COVID, but uh, which is going to last a few days. So uh, thanks for turning up today. I think everyone appreciates it and uh, uh, hopefully uh, learn that, you know, this is just, as you said, like a bad cold. Uh, yeah, that's right. You may notice I'm a bit snuffly. Um, and luckily, all of us are, are quite well. Um, but kids do still get COVID, but luckily they are usually asymptomatic. Yeah, they're, they're better, more, and it's the adults that, that take longer to recover. Um, now, uh, Brendan, do you just want to give a few words about the sort of work you do? Yeah, of course. Um, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Claire. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm Brendan Street. I'm Professional Head of Emotional Wellbeing with Nuffield Health. I've worked in um, mental health for over 25 years, initially as a psychiatric nurse, but more latterly as a CBT therapist and supervisor. I think in terms of what I found really difficult about um, a about the pandemic is, is loneliness. As a therapist myself, I'm, I'm a very sort of gregarious person, like to meet people. And I've, I've personally struggled with, with that sense of loneliness. I work as part of a, of a therapy team and we're quite keen on, you know, get togethers and seeing each other in person and bouncing ideas off each other. And those water cooler moments when you're not just talking about work on a Zoom call, I've personally missed that. On the flip side of that, what, what I've enjoyed is spending more time with my dog, Edna, um, and who's a bed linked terrier. So being able to spend more time time with her, I think I think I, th I think dogs' mental health might suffer at the end of the pandemic as everybody starts to go back to work because they've been used to being people around all the time. So I suppose that's the flip the flip side to it. But a bit like Claire was saying, I think the other side that I've had is is the purpose bit and and in terms of getting stuck in with something that I really value. Um, within Nuffield Health, we've got 16,000 employees across hospitals, gyms, and our corporate sites. All of our hospitals went over to support the NHS in terms of COVID, which had a massive impact on the emotional well-being of our staff. Um, we had we had uh, hospitals that were um, that had no deaths in in 25 years, and they went to having like a lot of deaths in two weeks. So obviously that has a big impact on the nursing staff there. So 
in terms of us turning our emotional well-being proposition inward and supporting our own people i think that gave gave me a real sort of purpose and probably balanced out the feeling feelings of loneliness so yeah that's me well as, as claire said from just from a personal point of view uh in a way one of the reasons the zoe app was founded was as struggling for something to do in you know while everyone was being shut down and felt useless so uh it certainly uh, meant for myself and i think as claire's mentioned the whole of the team gave us uh, a real motivational goal to to do this and we we, we didn't have time in those first uh, few months really to think of anything uh, but i've certainly been helped by uh, managing to go into work uh, one, at least once a week uh, that's just a change of scenario was really important for me. I found that you know, not changing your environment after so many years of doing, having a routine uh, was important. And um, I kept up with my meditation as well, which I, I've been doing since I was 18. And that uh, at times of stress and tiredness, I found that really helpful as well as, you know, finding some time to, to talk to friends outside that, you know, the, the COVID field uh, and take your mind off it. But um yeah, and, and of course, exercise, um, you know, cycling and swimming and things. And most all of us have found some way of, of coping. But um, anyway, we're, we're probably the lucky ones, uh, but there's plenty who haven't been as, um, as lucky. And I just want to, Brenda, can you talk to us quickly about what we mean by mental health? Because it's, it's a very slightly vague term for many people. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, term within the UK because I think when people hear mental health, they think mental ill health. Uh, and mental health is a lot more than the absence of mental ill health, just in the same way physical health is. But if you look at the broad definition, so the World Health Organization has a definition that, that refers to it as a state of well being where people are able to realize their own abilities. So you're able to cope with stresses, you're able to contribute to your community, you're able to maintain relationships and you're able to work product productively. So across lots of different areas um, contributes to people's mental health. I think as a, as a CBT therapist, and I've still got a clinical caseload, when, when I'm looking at somebody's mental health, when they come to see me for, for therapy, I'm looking at the way they think, the way they behave, the way they feel physically and the way they feel emotionally and how those four areas interact within an environment so that's what i'm looking at but i think i think you're right it is a vague term but also um also a term that i'd say i'd say in the, in the uk particularly has has led to people thinking of mental ill health rather than mental health in the way you would think of physical health and um, i think we often jump on that and i think because of that we've got a mental ill health system within the uk rather than a mental health system and I think if one thing COVID has, has taught us, it's that it's that prevention side of mental health that, we, that we've been missing for far too long. And hopefully, as terrible as it's been, it gives that the impetus for that. I think the other thing that I'm really passionate about is language around mental health. Uh, and it's connected, I think, to the mental ill health that for too long, I think the language around mental health has been medicalized. And because of that, people don't feel that they've got... Um, a framework to talk about mental health so they don't particularly in the work setting people don't, still don't feel comfortable talking about it and that's because it's disorder condition etc etc so that's another area that i feel really passionate about that we can change so do you think normal people fluctuate anyway is there anyone who really is that stable who never goes into some dip i mean you know i know most of us have myself included have felt you know several weeks being a bit miserable and down compared to weeks when you're feeling high is that do you think everybody comes in that category so everyone dips below some threshold at some point or is that just some people i think we all exist on a continuum um, from you know from thriving to just about surviving to then entering into mental ill health maybe all of us don't enter into mental ill health but we're still hovering on that continuum depending what's happening to us in life i think that's where a stat like one in four, so they often heard stat that you get one in four of us experience a mental health problem over the course of a year, is a bit othering. Because I don't know about you, when I hear stats like that, I'm with the other people and poor bloke over here that's got mental ill health, but that's not me. And I think we need to move to more of four in four, that we've all got mental health and we're just on that continuum depending what's going on. And because of that, you need different support at different times in your life. 
So it's a bit like, in a way, your weight changes, you know, month to month, but it doesn't mean you're either obese or you're skinny. Is that, is that, you sort of, um, I think, yeah, need, and, as you said, different yeah, languages. Think, yeah, I think so. And without doubt, don't get me wrong, I think, and there are some people that at the end of that continuum where you're starting to dip into mental ill health, need a different type of support, and then it does become more of a medical, well, a psychosocial medical intervention. And, and for, for people in that, in that sort of area of the continuum, then, then words like depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress might be really useful because it explains to me what my symptoms are. So on an individual level, I think that works. I think on a societal level, it becomes confusing because nobody actually knows what post-traumatic stress means or depression means or anxiety means and they're alien terms and it puts people off having a discourse about mental health wider but yeah but yeah in terms of that continuum we're all on it at some point and we all we yeah. all differ in our need that's why i think we can all relate a little bit to you know um, to some degree anyway about these problems um come back to you claire um the the, the zoe king team uh, together did probably the, one of the lar world's largest studies into mental health uh, during the pandemic uh, on the effects of the pandemic on uh, people's, people's mental health. So what, can you summarise briefly what we found? Yes, um, that's right. So thanks to everybody who filled in um, the questionnaire that we had on the app in about Jan February, March time, where we asked some questions really that cover that spectrum, Brendan, that you were talking about. Um, in particular in relation to two common symptoms, um, one being anxiety-related symptoms and one being depression-related symptoms. And um, we, we found a spectrum, uh, as one might expect. But if we think about um, uh, people who have sort of severe symptoms or more severe symptoms of anxiety and depression, um, say back a few years ago before the pandemic, we would see roughly one in one in five individuals might uh, be sort of hitting that mark of maybe falling towards the uh, having mental he ill health in terms of anxiety and depression uh, in a whole population and, and as i say that's uh, notwithstanding the fact that it's a continuum um and in the pandemic we found that it's a bit more than that it's about one in four people and that's something that's been corroborated in other studies so for example um, there's a really great study called Understanding Society, which is a UK longitudinal survey, and they've been asking people throughout the pandemic on a month by month basis um, about these sorts of symptoms. Um, and um, again, they found that um, compared to before the pandemic, that 19% of people had sort of these issues with anxiety and depression symptoms that sort of went up a bit after the first wave to about 25%. And then sort of by September, by the time people were coming out of lockdown, um, it, it came back down to 20%. And then in the, in the winter again, it got a little bit worse. And I think that just ex expresses the fact that overall in the population, we have been affected by these lockdowns, these big social changes, this loneliness, the, 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 the social isolation, but that it, is, it, it comes back again. Um, but then I think one thing that's really important, Tim, is that those figures are sort of one in five, whatever, they, what they really don't reflect is how each one of us has experienced this differently. And each one of us, um, you know, that, that's one in five, it hides a big difference in, within the population where some people have been very severely affected and some people have really much improved in terms of their mental health uh, and have really found new engaging things to do in this new world of, uh, maybe being more at home, maybe being able to engage in pursuits that they hadn't been able to do before. So um, I think that some people have gotten a lot better and some people have gotten a lot worse. And interestingly, in all the national core studies, that's what we're seeing, that some of the cohorts are showing very different patterns and changes to others. And that probably reflects differences in the populations that are being studied. Yeah, I think it's quite surprising to some people that actually some people, it seem to enjoy the experience of lockdown um, maybe a bit like you know war time or whatever and um, uh, some sort of feeling of, of community maybe they saw their family more do you have any reasons for that or is that just that their other life wasn't very nice and so actually they you know they were commuting for four hours a day or something I don't know well exactly I mean that's exactly um, it, within the app we asked some questions about what people had been doing more 
and what people had been doing less over the pandemic. And we weren't particularly linking these in with their answers to the anxiety and depression questions. But we did see a very clear relationship between the two. And unsurprisingly, it's things like having that extra green space experience that many of us found in the first lockdown in particular, where people were spending more time in green spaces. That was really associated with more positive mental health um, responses on the questions. Um, likewise, um, uh, spending more time with family, interacting socially were all good things. Um, whereas things like um, uh, using more um, alcohol or smoking um, and doing more work actually, um, uh, I guess, depending on whether it was purposive work, I guess that might be different. But we asked the question about work and, and those you know, people who were spending a lot of time working and who were using alcohol and cigarettes more had a worse mental health than those that didn't. And where, did where you live make a difference in terms of areas of deprivation or, um, you know, urbanly rural? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. And actually, the, the findings are a little complex in regard to that. Um, certainly, uh, and we saw this within Twins UK, Tim, as well, and others have seen it um, within other cohort studies, um, that it appears that younger people actually overall have been more affected by these changes in lockdown than older people. And that's really interesting. I don't know whether you're nodding, Brendan. I wonder whether um, you could sort of give us some insights into why that is, but I wonder whether actually younger people's life has been much more dramatically affected by the social restrictions put upon behavior, which generally younger people are much more gregarious maybe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, uh, but, but also we saw that actually younger people in rural areas were more disproportionately affected than those in urban areas. And it was the opposite for older people. Older people in urban areas had more uh, changes, negative changes in mental health after lockdown. So I think that maybe um, has two purposes. One, it could help understand what kind of resources we might need to be putting in place if we do have to go into another lockdown, God forbid. <laughs> and the second is um, that it tells us, um, uh, you know, what resources to focus on in the future. Yeah, thanks, Claire. And do you think, Brandon, that this also tells us, you know, as an individual level, we can learn a bit from this experience to say, well, what, what things make us happy and unhappy? I, you know, in terms of our life priorities, you know, does, do you think we can use this experience to generalize, you know, post COVID about what the sort of things are important to us? I think so. I think it has, it has brought that into focus and we'll come to it later when we talk about resilience. But one of the pillars of resilience is about having value and purpose in your life. And I think for a lot of people, it has really, really focused that actually what is important. Um, so it's done that. I think on Claire's point in terms of um, the way that, um, so the, the pandemic's e affected us all, but not equally. So it has really been that amplifier of the inequality. And I yeah. think on that, and then and, and interesting when you do look at that group, 16 to 24, in terms of like younger people, it's massively impacted on them. Uh, I think there is, and like you say, it's probably a complex sort of interplay of factors in terms of because the other the other impact is people with living with low resources. So I think there's probably a, a, a combination effect there. But the, the, that 16 to 24 age group is interesting in terms of the impact it has on that then um, interacting psychologically as a peer group. So that, that that's really important at that age because it's just the age when you're moving away from parents being important to so your actual peer group being more important to you. And um, so I think that is that is really important in terms of what's happened with with that that peer group. So and I think that the way that they've been impacted uh, unequally is also affected by the fact. And, and this is from um, clinical experience as well, talking to people is that they feel that they've had their futures robbed. Mm. So in terms of like university and the way that things were going to be, so life was going to be, it isn't going to be because it's changed massively. And I think that's something that, like Claire was saying, we need to be cognizant of when we look forward to what services are going to look like. Because across the board, when you look at it, because um, we, we Northfield North Health did the Healthier Nation Index as well, which is similar, but not as big as yours, but it was 8,000 people. But, but we found that, that that sleep sleep for that age group, 16 to 24, was massively impacted. Loneliness was massively impacted. Anxiety was massive. And it, it, across the board, when you look at it, so there's something going on there with our young people, and I think we, we need to be cognizant of it going forward. Most people thought social media would help them, but it, it did 
in this particular group, it didn't seem to uh, mitigate it much. Maybe maybe it helped the more young, the younger teenagers. I don't know. Was there any evidence for that? Is that for Claire? That one. Well, either of you really. Um, do you think uh, so? So what you're saying is that in that in that group that you know the sort of eighteen to twenty four year olds, social media didn't help. They were you know they were really struggling uh, yeah, to come to terms with this. Whereas I, I get the feeling that say you know maybe twelve to you know sixteen year olds were less affected because uh, they could still keep in contact. Possibly, and I think again like. Like Claire said, it's probably a complex picture because of the time window that you've got. So you've got pockets of different types of lockdown and then different psychological expectations that it probably it probably shifts about a little bit in terms of how it's affecting those age groups. And, and Claire, one more thing before we move on is, do you think there was a difference between the first lockdown and the second lockdown? I know we didn't study it exactly, but um, your views. Well, Actually, um, it, uh, we, we, we have got some things to say about that. And I think um, I'll come on to it in the, in the next bit when we talk about COVID and, um, and mental okay, health. Please. But, but, what, what, but what we did see, though, is that there's a very different effect um, after um, the, in the second lockdown. Mm -hmm. And I think that's partly because vaccinations were on the horizon. And I think we certainly see that... Um, Vaccine, you know, having having a way out, having um, a, a door out of this has been really helpful for people, and it's helpful for people in terms of whatever they're facing at the time in their life. So it probably impacts mental health across the board. Actually, I don't know whether you felt that as well, Brendan. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, one one of the key things in terms of anxiety and and loneliness is is a degree of hopelessness and helplessness. And I think initially there was that helplessness and hopelessness in people. And I think you're right, that second lockdown and then the, the, the vaccine coming out of that gave people a sense of hope, uh, hopefulness and, and that we, we can do something about this. I think interestingly, if you look at the third lockdown, that was a, that was interesting one psychologically as well, because that was almost like we were at full time in a football match winning. Then somebody equalised and we had to go into extra time that we didn't realise we had to do and everybody's exhausted. And I think you got a real rebound <laughs> into that that you know almost bodies on, on, the, on the pitch not being able to get up to, to rouse themselves for the next the next um, the next 50 minutes so I think there definitely there definitely was that in terms of the third lockdown as well. Okay all right well let's um let's change tack a little bit we've got some great questions from uh the app users the Zoe app users on, on Slido and there's one here just saying um my concentration levels are non-existent um and I'm completely unmotivated regarding many of the activities and goals I had uh, pre-lockdown. You know, does this mean I'm just lazy uh, or is this a common feature? So that's very clear. Do you want to start that one? Well, that's a really interesting one because, um, Tim, in our department, um, you may remember we did a, a sort of um, one of these word um, diagrams where everybody put in um, their feeling about how work had been over the last year. We did it about the year point. And, you know, quite a lot of people um, did say sort of un, uh, low motivation, not able to concentrate. And I think, you know, that's in our, 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 our sort of big departmental team. I think it's, it's clearly been a feature, but it's also been, um, uh, you know, balanced by other things sometimes. And I think, you know, in a way, this has been a moment, hasn't it, for us to all consider what is important. What are the things that really motivate us? what are the things that we really care about and sometimes that's not work sometimes that's been family or um sometimes we realize that the way we work um is important so as you said tim like you know you going into the office was really important um i haven't really needed that although i have gone in clinically once a week but i don't feel i need that to sort of motivate myself but i think many of our colleagues sort of really do feel that actually going somewhere, being somewhere new, interacting with people is really important for their own motivation. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a natural reaction to this just incredible year to um, maybe have found a bit of time when you've lost motivation. And there's a bit of a follow-up question here. It's about um, how the pandemic might have affected mental health of people who previously had, had absolutely no issues at all. I mean, so how much do you think we're talking about people had already suffered a little bit and we're getting worse or better or you know, people who are previously very pretty stable. Do you think, did our survey really 
enlighten us on that? Um, well, is, yes. So um, we, we did see a, a very strong relationship between previous history of mental health diagnoses and um, uh, our sort of anxiety and depression scores um, now within the pandemic. And I think that's definitely shown in other studies as well, that one of the strongest predictors is actually prior actual mental health in illness. Um, um, and I mean, really importantly, uh, as well as that, within the national core studies of which TWINS is a part, um, we've shown that healthcare disruption and societal disruption, so socioeconomic disruption has been much worse, much more problematically experienced by people who have existing mental health problems. And I think that this comes back to sort of a need really to make sure that um, the, the individuals with mental, mental health existing problems are protected in these kind of situations. Yeah, okay. So um, final question on this, this section really says, um, I've suffered from anxiety, but I was okay during lockdown. But for the last few weeks since uh, restrictions have been much lightened or lifted, my stress and anxiety has recurred. So why is this? So, Brendan, is this something that you've noticed? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, we were talking before about people that may have found the lockdown okay and been okay with it. If you look at something like social anxiety, anxiety about being around other people, somebody with social anxiety or panic um, would, would have felt okay because there was nothing that they had to do. They weren't pushed outside their, their, their comfort zone, so they would have felt okay. And I think, again, and again, in terms of that, I suppose what the lockdown did in, in a lot of ways is, is gave certainty. So there's lots of things that you couldn't do or didn't have to do. With uh, things opening up again and with the new world we're entering into, it, it creates loads of uncertainty and uncertainty is almost like the pollen to anxiety. So that people don't like uncertainty. What uncertainty creates is what ifs. And once you get lots of what if this, what if that, what if the other, that's when the anxiety st starts to grow. So yeah, definitely it makes sense that people are starting is to it, get more anxiety. Is it more the what ifs or do you think it's more the multiple life choices people have to make uh, in that environment that's, that causes that stress? I suppose it's a combination of the two, because I suppose that the multiple choices in terms of life choices and lifestyle choices and things changing then um, um, then causes the what ifs. And then the what people confuse what ifing with problem solving um, mm. and, and what if you're fighting smoke all the time. You're not actually problem solving. So the, the interesting thing about um, anxiety that's generalized anxiety, I suppose we're talking about here, anxiety about lots of different things, is it differs from the, the other types of anxiety in that you get a, a high level of fatigue. And that's because it's exhausting to fight the smoke all the time, the, the what ifs. And I think yeah. that's common at the moment in, in terms of that yeah. pandemic fatigue. It's interesting, I, there were lots of comments when um, an American report came out saying, you don't have to disinfect your, pack, your Amazon packaging or, or uh, you don't have to sort of put it in quarantine for three days outside your door. I had actually a lot of uh, people on Twitter and uh, uh, emails saying, you know, I find this really hard to deal with now because I've got used to this routine of, yep. of uh, sort of quarantining my letters, my post and whatever. And I, I'm actually really stressed now. I don't believe it, you know. And so this is an interesting thing. I, I think we're going to see more, more of, aren't we, as we, uh, as, as we come out. Uh, people have got these become a bit set in their ways and, and trying now to realise they have to accept some uncertainty. Uh, I think that's going to be very interesting. But um, let's let's move on um, to really the, the results of COVID infection and mental health. And it's because not just lockdowns and change to life that have an impact, uh, you know, it's whether you've had COVID or not and how badly you've had it. So um, I'm going to start with Claire on this. Um, so, uh, your team also looked at the the effect, didn't it, or whether it made it better or worse. Uh, maybe you could just talk a bit about the, those findings. Yeah, so we were interested to look at this because obviously um, um, we we know that there are some um, sort of mental health or even psychiatric components to some elements of COVID. For example, right at the beginning, Tim, you'll remember that we. Um, showed that acute confusional states are quite a common presenting feature of older people 
um, especially older people who are frail with acute COVID. Um, and so, and 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 also, um, there are definitely elements to some individuals' experience of long COVID, which um, are psychological, neuropsychiatric. So you mentioned the brain fog, Tim, but also um, there are other sort of um, reports that have happened, and definitely cases that have happened. Although I think they are quite rare. So we were interested to see, okay, well, what about COVID for everybody? I mean, quite a lot of people, as we know, are asymptomatic with COVID or have a very mild illness. Does it actually have any repercussions or is it related to their mental health? And we've got this amazing opportunity because it's a very large study to look at this and see whether there's an effect. Um, and it comes on the back of some other studies that have put out sort of slightly alarming uh, data that suggests that actually, yes, there's a big effect on mental health. Um, so reassuringly, we saw a very small increased risk of anxiety and depression symptoms if you had COVID in the past. Um, and we looked at a, a huge number of individuals, but it's a, so, it's, so, so we can detect a really tiny um, it, positive sort of risk. But it's very small in comparison to other mental health problems. So, I mean, take, for example, um, uh, we already mentioned a previous history of mental health problems that has a much, much higher risk than COVID in the last year. Or even being of obese weight or even overweight um, or underweight, uh, those things have a much higher risk. Um, even having just one other medical condition um, of any type. Um, gives you a much greater risk than COVID infection in the last year. So I think I think that, that you know there is an effect, um, but it's actually very small. Um, and so well, I guess that's a reassuring finding. Yeah, no, that should reassure most people. But I mean, there are a small subsection of people who've had really quite bad COVID or particularly long COVID, where they had this prolonged brain fog for weeks or months. Do you, is there any evidence so far that they will have some long-term uh, mental health problems? Yeah, so you're absolutely right that there is a small proportion of individuals that get um, COVID that go on to get long COVID, so that's more, more than 12 weeks of illness. And some of those individuals have mental health issues, particularly brain fog and so on. Um, from our data and other data, it appears that that diminishes over time. And I think it's an open question yet, Tim, whether or not there's going to be longer term problems. I think we need really quite long term follow ups um, in order to really establish that. And I mean, as a geriatrician, um, I, I do um, have a particular interest in this because we've seen that, for example, delirium, that acute confusional state um, is associated with progression and risk of future dementia and so on. And so, of course, it is possible that that is the case for, for coronavirus as well. Um, and so I think it's really important for us to continue to research this and to do carefully designed, detailed longitudinal studies, including maybe with imaging. But um, I think it's quite reassuring that we don't see a big effect on mental health at this point in the pandemic. Okay, and uh, just to point out, you are looking for donations, aren't you, for that project for, to try and work out what's gonna happen years into the future and you can donate on the app. Um, okay, so a more general question here. Um, do, do, are we expecting a tsunami pandemic of mental health problems after this, you know, and how does our pandemic relate to say the trauma of after the, you know, the last world war? I, I wanna, do you, you or Brendan wanna take this first? Um, what's, your, what's your view, Claire? I'll let Brendan go. Go for oh, it. Brendan, first. you go. It's it's a really it's a really complex picture, I think, and it, I suppose it hinges on definitions of mental health in terms of the impact. I mean, the Centre for Mental Health have estimated that an extra ten million people will require additional support due to COVID, and have said that it's going to have as big an impact on the mental health of the nation as the Second World War. But then, when you look at it. And you look at the reporting around the Second World War and the impact on the mental health. There isn't a big report of impact on mental health, but 
but then if you look at it even deeper and you, you find out what are they, what were they actually measuring anyway so i think a lot of the impact of the second world war in terms of the mental health of the nation went unreported anyway so it's difficult it's difficult to look at it I, I think there's definitely going to be an echo and i think we need to keep it's almost like as as the pandemic we need to keep our wits about us because as the pandemic starts to dip down in terms of the physical impact that echo of, of, of that mental health echo is going to come in terms of what it looks like and predictions that I've heard about suicide rates rocketing. I don't think that's going to happen and there's no evidence that suicide rates have increased. But I think what, what the watch out for me is and we talked about kids before and we talked about reintroduction into, into natural life. There's a lot of those young children that have been that have been brought up to fear others. Um, you know, in terms of contact with others or going near others. And, and I think that's a watch out in terms of services about what the, we don't know, because it's, again, uh, this word that we hear all the time, unprecedented, but I think it's, it's, it's a watch out in terms of how that, has, how that will impact. And I think in terms of wider population, I think it, it, it's probably simplistic to look at it just at rates of, at rates of anxiety and depression per se. I think we need to look at it more as a distress model because I think that there, there are going to be higher levels of distress that will impact in different areas. But again, coming to a medical model, it's simplistic to look at it from a purely diagnostic, will we get more anxiety and depression? Because I'm not sure that we will. Um, mm -hmm. but I think we'll get more distress. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think that that's really, really good points. I mean, I just wanted to reiterate that, you know, while we might not see an effect of the disease on um, mental health right now, we're clearly going to see echoes of this in terms of the nation's mental health. And we've sort of already picked up a few key areas. The children one is really key, isn't it? So, uh, or even babies. I mean, yeah. babies who've been born and spent the first year of their life without interaction with any others, uh, other people, that's going to have an impact. Uh, young families who deal with people who, who have um, individuals with learning disabilities have been really massively affected over this lockdown. And I think that's going to have imp impression. Then the educational differences that have happened, that's going to have its own echo. And then, you know, thinking about uh, across the life course, um, um, people of all ages, um, including sort of my patients and geriatric services, have been turning to alcohol. Yeah. and cigarettes a little bit you know especially alcohol a bit more um and i think that's going to have its own impact i mean tim we st we, sh we showed didn't we that people's diet has changed uh, some people gotten worse in their diet some people have gotten better in their diet and that um will have its own implications that, that's a behavioral change that will have its own implications for people's health going forward mm -hmm. and then finally sort of maybe thinking about towards the end of life you know many people have suffered a bereavement during this time. And that bereavement has happened when uh, they've not been able to go through the usual um, process of being able to be with that loved one. And, and that, has, that, that will have really significant long-term impact upon that individual, those individuals. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it, it probably will have societal impact because um, that's really affected so many individuals um, and of course, healthcare workers as well, being being part of that story. Yeah, and not just bereavement. I mean, the, the the feeling of powerlessness to not be able to see your relatives in care homes and things like this. Um, you know, I know personally because I wasn't able to see my mum in the care home, and I think, you know, eventually they you know they will uh, pass away, and you will feel that you know that that year or so that you know was lost to those people. So it's not just the, the instant bereavement it's also that that lost feeling of that that potential bonding and yeah. I, mean, I think there's a it's a very wide area isn't it so i think it's we have, probably haven't got time to cover all of them <laughs> yeah. but uh, i think it's, you know, i was encouraged the fact that actually the suicide rate didn't go up and i think that does show something about you know the resilience which we're going to discuss and and, you know, and this sort of group perhaps group spirit the fact that a lot of people felt they were you know a lot of people feeling the same thing at the same time rather than on their own, which yeah. might be very different. Do you agree with that, Brendan? Yeah, I do. I think the watch out really is that one size doesn't fit all here. And there are, I think like Claire touched on there, because of this amplification of inequalities, there will be groups that, that you know, like people from uh, BAME communities, people who are living with low resources that will be impacted more. And I think it's about 
service provision going forward and children looking at those groups properly in terms of the needs of those groups rather than um, the, the shock sort of horror statistics that we've seen reported across the whole of the population in those cohorts I think they, that there will be certain needs that we need to start looking at now. Um, I'll just uh, go on to uh, some interesting facts here because we did uh, a poll on uh, asking people on the app uh, about whether they felt less or more anxious after having had the vaccine. So um, and I just get a quick comment from both of you on, on these results. So 71% said they felt less anxious, 27% uh, no change, and 2% felt more anxious. Do you think um, that that's reflective of the whole population? Do you think that's, did you, you know, do you have any, do you think that 2% feeling more anxious is, uh, it, is just a few people or is it, um, uh, that's, um, you know, because I think that should be reassuring for people that um, uh, it did help. And again, it goes back to Claire's point, I think, about, about that light at the end of the tunnel um, as, as we're out of it. Yeah, I mean, coming back to that, I sort of um, didn't mention before about we looked at um, the relationship between um, COVID diagnosis and mental health looking at stratifying, so adjusting for different time windows. And we found that there was a much greater effect of COVID on mental health for the early pandemic, but ones that were like more recent since the vaccine had come out, actually there was much, it was in fact negative, no relationship. Um, and so that's really interesting that, that the effect on mental health appeared to change across the pandemic in such a way that might, ex might, might, might make you think that things like having some hope with the vaccine, that, that, that changing um, lockdown as well, um, might have an effect on people's experience of mental health issues after COVID infection. And I think that, that this in a sense reflects what you're saying, Tim, that um, people generally have been less anxious um, because they know that vaccinations will help us get out of the pandemic. Yeah, okay. So now we've looked at the research, so I'm sure people uh, watching this want to know a bit more about what we can all do to support mental health uh, better. Um, and so um, this brings us on really to this, this concept of resilience, which I think is important uh, way to help people. Um, uh, you know, do, um, do you think resilience is the way to start this this uh, discussion, Brendan? Potentially. I mean, I, I think the difficulty with the word resilience is it's had a bit of bad press, um, particularly for those of us in, from, from a corporate sort of set, setting, probably seeing resilience sessions all the time. I think people see it as just being bulletproof, you know, that your employer just expects you to take whatever's thrown at you. So I think it's had a, had a bit of a bad press. Into, I, I'd prefer that the term prescience, so being able to predict stuff and, and be able to put things in place so that you don't get affected by stuff, but we're stuck with resilience in a way. But I think as long as you define what it isn't, so it isn't being bulletproof, uh, it isn't something that's a fixed trait, you can learn to be more resilient. And I think it's probably worthwhile starting here because in terms of the pillars, what you would describe as the five pillars of resilience are basically just five pillars that will keep you mentally well. Um, so in terms of, you know, being able to, um, and we, we touched on it right at the start, um, values and purpose. So living your life in terms of your values. So values are just a general direction you want to go in life. So for me, what my, one of my values in life is, is being a good dad. So be, having that value, but then the most important thing is being able to engage in behaviours that, that, that chime with that, that value. There's no point, I, I see many patients that, that their values have got out of sync with their behaviours. So I might think, you know, my value is to be a good dad, but because I'm working all the time, prepping, prepping for webinars, I don't actually see my daughter at all. So then that's, that's where it, it, starts to, it starts to drift. So I think in, in terms of the five pillars of, of, of resilience, so good mental health, one is values and purpose, really important one. One is about mind, so being able to think about the way that you think. And I think this is what we're not taught at school and we need to be in terms of thinking is just brain noise. 
and we need to think a bit more about the way that we're thinking. So mind is another one. Connections, which we've touched upon all the way through this. So one of the key pillars to good emotional well-being is having good connections and relationships with others, which has obviously been challenged massively during the pandemic. Body in terms of eating the right stuff, drinking the right stuff. Claire's touched a few times on alcohol, which is a really big one, I think, in the clinical space. And also being able to sleep. Sleep is a big one for me in terms of what the impact of the pandemic on sleep. And then, and then the final one in terms of um, those five pillars is self. And, and, and that's about having self-compassion. And I think compassion, again, has, has got a bad press, really, and, it, and it's, seen as, it's seen as something that's letting yourself off. But self-compassion is really important to good mental well-being and that being able to be a critic, but not a harsh, judgmental critic all the time to yourself. And I think those five pillars, so values, mind, connections, body and self, they would be the way to, to look at um, you know, resilience, but more, more, more than resilience, just good mental health. That's great. Uh, Claire, have you got anything to add, maybe from a, the angle of some of your patients, you know, more the more elderly ones that might be struggling? Well, yeah, I mean, I, actually, I was thinking that um, one of the factors that's not there, but could be in the body space is around uh, outdoors and nature mm -hmm. and uh, and other beings, not necessarily um, human ones. So yeah. you mentioned your dog. Um, Brendan and I wonder whether sort of uh, over this lockdown period lots of people have gotten new uh, new pets and animals and, and we did show that there was um, a positive relationship between having pets and mental health but also the green space thing so being alive to nature um, to greenness to the outdoors that encourages physical exercise which we think is good as well but maybe there's a, a really beneficial effect of that and maybe that's something to do with this urban rural divide in terms of mental health as well. Um, I don't know. And it speaks to purpose as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Again, looking after either a kid or a, uh, an animal or something else gives, gives you a bit more focus in that way. Okay, all right, so that, that's, that's resilience. Um, and uh, just briefly, um, is there anything else for people who are, who are maybe more, uh, you know, they, They've done things themselves, but is there anything they to get support, uh, Brendan? Because you work for this kind of charity. What what should people do if they think they need extra support, or or you're the relative of someone who think you think they need this extra support? What what would you advise? Yeah, I think it's tricky in the mental health space, and we touched on it right at the very start in terms of prevention. And I think for a long time in this country, people have felt they've got to be really poorly to get help in terms of mental health. And I, I would much rather people ask early on. And if you, know, if, if you feel that you're not right, you feel in distress, being able to ask early on and being able to use local sort of resources in terms of getting that, that help via, I think Claire, we talked uh, before, the, before we, we came on about IAP services. So the um, improving access to psychological therapy services that each area will have an IAP service that people then can, you know, normally start off with like a, a really simple telephone assessment just to get an idea of your needs, which the, which which then will get you the right sort of help. And that might not be face-to-face -face therapy. That might be that you just need some self-help or some guided self-help therapy. But the message would be that no problem's too small. Don't leave it. You know, get support. With, within, within Nuffield, we deliver, you know, we deliver treatment to people. And my message when I, when I do telephone assessments, because people always, always, they always come on saying, you know, is it just me or am I just being daft? And, it, and it's not, it, you're not being daft. If you don't feel right, you feel in distress, then come and, come and seek support early on. Um, and I think that would be my, my main message. The other, the other area, a bit in terms of self-help, um, and particularly we talked about sleep before, because for me as a clinician, sleep is a gateway. So sleep tends to be the first thing that goes before you experience anxiety or low mood. And then really cruelly, it tends to be the last thing that you get back as, you get, as you're getting well. And I think sleep is a key one for people to look at in terms of if you want to do something to fix your mood, look at your sleep pattern. But I think we often overcomplicate it. If you look at how many sleep apps or sleep this, pillows, silk, silk cushions, I think it is now, isn't it, in terms of sleep? But if you look at how many things there are, it's overcomplicated. And I think my message would be, if you're going to change something about your sleep and improve it, then, then think small. So make small changes, but act big really commit to them because I think often we do lots of things to try and fix our sleep and then don't stick to them so I think maybe those two 
two, two areas would be my, my tips. Yeah, and the other thing I would add is, is I think there are lots of studies now showing that the effects of diet yeah. are, for, for certainly for mild uh, depression, anxiety are as good as antidepressants. Yeah. And so, uh, and they've done some studies with probiotics as well. So first, you know, as well as sleep, as well as exercise, do look at your diet. And we know that junk foods, you know, um, ultra processed foods are bad for your gut microbes and they can be very bad for your uh, mental well-being as well. So I think that's something that doctors often don't discuss. Your GPs don't discuss that first. And I think really important that people learn from these trials, which have been actually amazing uh, for mild disease. I'm not, not talking about severe ones, but for the mild stuff we're talking about here, uh, I think that that's also really a really important thing that everyone can do. And that just means, you know, getting more diversity of vegetables, you know, cooking meals yourself uh, and, and getting away from snacking and, and junk foods. Just give it a month, you know, and try it out uh, along, along with your sleep. Yeah, okay. yeah, I, I, I would I would second that as well, Tim. And maybe it's that it's that communal family as well, where you can sit down with household members for, for a meal. That's really really positive social engagement and yeah. don't forget the physical the physical activity side of it you know really helps with sleep as well um so so these these behaviors can be really useful i i just wanted to sort of um uh, echo what you said brendan about iap services um and so i just uh, so if anyone really wants to sort of engage in this you can just put in iapt and your council uh, into Google and you can find it. So I, I, I work in um, Lambeth and Southwark, so I'm often referring my patients to, to IAPT in Lambeth and Southwark. And people can actually um, self-refer online and then they either go through to a, a telephone or an online um, sort of counselling system, as it were, and they have found it really very helpful throughout the pandemic. And I think, you know, all of these services, including in Nuff Nuffield Health, you were telling us, Brendan, have, have moved online and can provide yeah. services online and that includes um, alcohol and smoking cessation as well. Um, so there is help available and, um, and now that it's gone online, it's much more accessible. But of course, you don't forget your GP as well. Tim, mm -hmm. I was seeing um, just last week some um, electronic health records data showing that people's um, consultations for almost every illness are still down on how they were pre-pandemic in that actually people are still not going to see their doctors about things that they should be. Um, diabetic checks, asthma checks, things like that. All of these things have dropped down and they've not yet recovered. And so GPs who are doing online, they're doing virtual assessments, they're not as busy as they were beforehand. So don't be afraid to contact your GP. If yeah, you that's that. a very good message. But we're sort of running out of time. So we've got about, uh, I'm trying to squeeze in another five questions that came up. Uh, from the app users. Uh, so if we can have some quick answers. Um, so one is, my husband is very anxious, leaving our house maximum 12 times only. So it's about once a month since March last year, uh, 2020. Can we help him reintegrate now he's fully vaccinated or how can we help him? Um, any, any ideas? Uh, I don't know the age of this person, but I guess, uh, I guess more elderly. Um, how do how, what are there any little tricks, quick tricks you you, you either of you have got? Um, from a therapy perspective, and really quickly, it would be a graded approach. So it's it's almost like it's called graded exposure. So gradually increasing the amount of the, the times he goes out, but the amount of times he spends out, and also um, really widening out the, the the activities that he engages in while he's there. But almost having like a if you imagine a ladder where things get more difficult as you go up the ladder a ladder of activities and planning it that way. So it's a great approach. Uh, um, another one for you, Brennan. Uh, Jenny uh, wants to know, might the continual tiredness uh, that she's feeling even after a good night's sleep and no COVID-19 or health issues be due just to the strain of living in a pandemic? And we've sort of answered this a bit, but, uh, or should we be looking for another cause, I guess is the question. I think probably two answers there. Yes, it could be because that, that effect of living in, in trauma. But the other ones to touch on Claire's point about these 
um, health help seeking behaviours that, that have dropped off. And interestingly, it's Men's Health Health Week from the 14th of June. Us men are terrible at health help seeking. Mm -hmm. um, so we've probably got a lot worse during the pandemic. So two answers to the question. Yes, it possibly could be. But if it continues on, don't, you know, don't just suffer in silence. Maybe get, a, get an opinion on that. Right. Claire, um, Julie on Slido asked, myself and a friend in our 50s noticed memory deterioration after lockdown, having trouble recalling words, forgetting things. How common is this? And, uh, and, and are there any tips, you know, you, you to, to improve this, this memory? Problem. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that any social change uh, like this has been an awful lot to think about. And when there's an awful lot to think about, that's when um, sort of short term memory issues start to come in and you start to forget what you went to the fridge for or you start to forget this because actually your brain is processing lots of other information. And we've all been doing that massively over the last year. Um, and, you know, I, I've seen in my um, sort of dementia assessment clinic, my memory clinic, I've seen quite a lot of referrals coming through um, with that sort of problem. And many of them, actually, we can't find any evidence of any, of any um, actual problem. We've done a lot of blood tests and so on to make sure there's no other intercurrent illness and people are actually are able to be reassured. Um, and I think certainly at the age of 50, I would be expecting that to be the case. But don't forget as well that other things can come in and affect um, your memory in your over 50s when you're a woman. And certainly the menopause does have an effect um, and um, HRT is really quite helpful in getting rid of that brain fog in menopause situation. So um, I guess if you're worried about it, do go and see your GP, make sure that there's nothing else going on. Um, they can do some objective cognitive measures and see whether they think there's anything happening there. Um, but if not, make sure you do enough physical exercise, keep your diet as good as possible. And these are really important factors and re-engage in life. And as your anxiety levels go down, hopefully your symptoms will go away as well. Okay, uh, and another one for you, you might be the best one to do this, but um, so when are doctors and social workers going to actually see people face to face again? And this is because I think this is coming from a, a carer Care has been alone in the community doing absolutely everything, uh, often you know, unrewarded, and they're, they're feeling a bit alone. So when's it all going to change, Claire? Yeah, well, I think that's a very good point. The carers have really taken a massive brunt of this pandemic and been going around seeing the frailest in our population, supporting them um, absolutely day in, day out, incredible people. And, um, you know, thanks to them, you know, we've gotten through this. Um, so in terms of doctors, actually, I've been seeing patients face to face since I think last September, um, uh, but we have majorly cut down who we see face to face and we're making sure that we see people face to face only if they really need it. And that, that means that then we can do virtual telephone or um, uh, Zoom uh, or other virtual sort of t conference, uh, video conferencing with um, our other patients, which actually saves them time, saves us time, uh, and is quite unstressful and you can do quite a lot with it. So I think um, uh, all, all GPs and doctors are now doing uh, more face to face, but you may find that actually it suits both of you to do more virtually now we've gotten a bit used to it. Great. And um, here's a question which I guess is um, for, for all of us. So the, the Zoe uh, COVID-19 information has helped we face the realities of the pandemic with regular information that can be trusted uh, and the person's worried that it's all going to stop after June the 21st. Uh, can we reassure them, Claire, that uh, we're going to carry on uh, doing this kind of stuff uh, for a few more weeks or months? Well, I don't think you and me are going away, Tim. I think there's still going to be lots of questions to answer. And um, at the moment, we're engaging with uh, the population on the app to see actually what you'd like to do going forwards from, from coronavirus. Obviously, we, we're still going to have quite a bit to do, I think, in terms of new variants, in terms of vaccination, new boosters, things like that. We've just talked uh, recently about um, post-vaccination infection. I think that's going to be a changing sphere as well. Um, but then beyond that, um, potentially there are other areas of health, Tim, that we could actually um, be, be together finding answers to, which would be really exciting if people were interested in that. Yeah, and I suppose, you know, I think what we've seen actually with this app is a revolution in how we collect healthcare data, 
how we give people information, how we uh, do research in real time, uh, engaging people in a two-way process. And I think, um, you know, we've been absolutely uh, amazed at the public's response that we still have, you know, over a million people still logging most days with us, telling us uh, about how they feel and trusting us with their data. So hopefully it'd be lovely to keep this going um, for years to come as, a, as an amazing tool for both the individuals doing it, but also for the whole, whole of the country. And I think that that's our, our goal here. So whoever asked that question, we're doing our best to keep going. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we love working together with all you guys. So um, I think we're running out of time here. So uh, thanks to Claire and thanks to, to Brendan. Uh, thanks for both for your amazing work. Uh, during this pandemic, I think you've um, helped so many people and I think this has uh, really been vital information. Uh, thanks to everyone who's given these amazing questions, uh, really on, on, on point there, and who also log with us every day and get other people to log on. And we still need many more people to keep doing it um, as we're going forward. And just to remind the Zoe COVID study is an essential tool still used by the government to help track the pandemic. Please keep logging, please keep sharing with friends and families and stay safe and look forward to seeing you soon.